Ladies and gentlemen, the 34th Bay of STEM Conference, co-hosted by Lockheed Martin Corporation, the Council of Engineering Deans of Historically Black Colleges and Universities, and U.S. Black Engineer and Information Technology Magazine, and sponsored by Aerotech and Boston Scientific Corporation, welcomes you to an evening with Bea's leading voices. Now, let's meet our hosts, a versatile talent with a velvet voice. Angela Stribling has produced and hosts many national awareness campaigns, including celebrating Black History vignettes and cameos of Black women for American Urban Radio Networks. She is the host of the hit radio show, Pillow Talk with Angela on 96.3 WHUR and Sirius XM 141, and was recently named radio host of WHUR's legendary Quiet Storm. Dr. Victor McCrary is the Vice President for Research and Graduate Programs at the University of the District of Columbia. He's responsible for the growth direction and oversight of the university's research enterprise. Named the 2011 Bay of Scientists of the Year, in 2016, Dr. McCrary was appointed by President Barack Obama to the National Science Board that oversees the National Science Foundation. Please give a warm welcome to Angela Stribling and Dr. Victor McCrary. Wow, oh my goodness. Thank you so much. Welcome to an evening with Bea's leading voices. Victor, it is so great to be back here again with you to honor our HBCUs for the exciting innovations and discoveries taking place on campuses across our nation. Yes, Angela, and because of my career-long association with HBCUs, that's historically black colleges and universities, this evening is especially meaningful for me. The significant contributions HBCUs are making in awarding degrees to minorities are having a profound national impact on the number of multicultural women and men who are ready to enter the workforce and contribute to the American economy. Thanks to these extraordinary contributions of people from diverse backgrounds, HBCUs are producing groundbreaking research and new product development as evidenced by their steadily increasing numbers of patents in every major field. And in 2019, this was all confirmed in a recent report, Angela, by the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Mathematics. And tonight, we are proud to honor five, count them, HBCU STEM innovators for their groundbreaking work. Yeah, that's so good. What has also become a highlight of our evening with Bayes' leading voices, are our Tech Talk speakers, who give us a front row seat on the latest technologies that are impacting our lives. Our first Tech Talk speaker is Dr. Lara Thompson, Associate Professor of Mechanical Engineering and Director of the Biomedical Engineering Program at the University of the District of Columbia. With the graying of America, we live in a rapidly aging world where falls, are of pressing concern. In the United States alone, death rates from falls by older adults have risen by 30% from 2007 to 2016. The United States Census Bureau predicts the world's percentage of individuals over age 65 will increase from 8.5% to approximately 17% between 2015 and 2050. This can contribute to severe personnel deficits, as well as limited health care solutions. Biomedical engineering is a relatively new and distinctive field that merges concepts in engineering to solve problems in human health. Addressing this in her presentation, Falls and Aging, the Need for Next-Gen Biomedical Solutions, please welcome to the stage Dr. Lara Thompson.
Hi, I'm Dr. Lara Thompson. I'm the director and initiator of the Biomedical Engineering Program and also the Center for Biomechanical and Rehabilitation Engineering at the University of the District of Columbia. And this evening, I want to talk to you about something that's relevant to all of us, falls in aging and the need for the next generation of biomedical solutions. So by show of hands, how many of you have experienced a fall or know somebody who's experienced a fall? So almost everybody in this room. So you see that it's something that's very relevant and pressing in terms of the need for research and researchers in this area. So we live in a rapidly aging world. So in 2015, about 8.5% of the world was comprised of people over 65 years old. By the year 2050, it's projected to nearly double to close to 17%. Also, fall death rates have linearly increased between 2007 and 2016 and will continue to increase um, as people get older. Despite an escalating elderly population, there are insufficient medical clinicians to meet the demand for health services. A shrinking workforce, a rapidly aging population, financial pressures, and increased consumer demand may translate into severe personnel deficits as well as limited healthcare solutions. So it's important that we expose, but most importantly engage, future prospective doctoral and medical students to go global health issues such as those tied to aging earlier on in their careers, for example, at the undergraduate level. This will lead to a greater understanding and stronger motivation for them to pursue health-related careers tied to aging. It's imperative that researchers of the future should be knowledgeable and skilled in the care of older individuals. And currently, the majority of public and global health training happens when students have already chosen their specialization area. It's pressing that the next generation Oops, I'm going backwards. It's pressing that the next generation research workforce on aging be cultivated to include diverse groups. So as you can see from this slide, the share of total population between 2016 and 2060 shows that Hispanic, African American, Asian, and mixed race people are projected to increase, but non-Hispanic white population is expected to decrease. So we really need to cultivate these untapped, un, unrepresent, underrepresented minority groups and use their talents. So that includes gender diversity, diversity in terms of race and ethnicity, people with disabilities, as well as people from varied socioeconomic backgrounds. In general, less than 20% of underrepresented minorities who enter the STEM fields pursuing their bachelors, um, actually complete their degree in STEM. So it's a challenge in terms of how we engage underrepresented minority students about STEM careers while not com compromising academic rigor. So we want to get the students involved, but at the same time, we want to have them have meaningful research experiences and professional development. So historically, black colleges and universities have a role to play in this. They comprise about 2% of our nation's degree-granting institutions. Um, however, they, pursue, they produce a large percentage, nearly 40% of all African-American STEM degree holders. Also, undergraduate experiences present a unique opportunity to inspire and educate our students earlier on in their careers. And there's a need for educational programs to engage and prepare undergraduate students for careers which improve global health issues such as those tied to aging. Biomedical engineering's multidisciplinary nature has a critical role to play in meeting this challenge. Biomedical engineering is a relatively new, distinctive, and multidisciplinary field that merges concepts in engineering to solve a wide and diverse array of problems tied to human health. UDC, or the University of the District of Columbia, the district's only public institute of higher education, a HBCU, and also the nation's only urban land grant institution, is poised to investigate biomedical engineering devices, designs, and interventions. The university offers a distinctive environment in that it's only one of three HBCUs 
nationwide to offer a Bachelor of Science degree in biomedical engineering. Further, the program places an emphasis on aging-related student research and training. Within the Center for Biomechanical and Rehabilitation Engineering, or CBRE lab, at the university, we investigate next-generation biomedical engineering solutions tied to human balance and mobility. So we're interested in research involving able-bodied people, so people without impairments, as well as people with impairments, but we place a specific emphasis on people that are aging, older individuals. We provide underrepresented minority students an unparalleled ecosystem with resources, equipment, experiences, mentoring, and professional development. Washington, D.C.'s population is comprised of over 30% of individuals greater than 50 years old. Through our National Science Foundation, investigating a new generation of assistive innovative technology or gate research initiation study through the National Science Foundation. Um, we're focused on balance and sensory training of older healthy individuals as well as people that have suffered stroke. In particular, we're interested on how sensory inputs and partial body weight supportive training can impact balance, gait, and also how this information can affect their multi-sensory integration. More recently, there's a new partnership and project called Facilitating Aging Individuals Living and Learning Preventative Fall Strategies, or FALLS, with the Department on Aging and Community Living tied to their Safe at Home program. The goal of the Safe at Home program is to implement in-home adaptations to reduce fall risk. The UDC CBRE lab investigates the impact of this program on people's balance, mobility, and also, also overall balance confidence. So from these two examples, you can see that we offer unique aging-related research experiences, typically only available to students at the graduate level, and provide an invaluable training experience to underrepresented minority students. So at UDC, I've had the passion, perseverance, motivation, and also importantly, interest, and placed an emphasis on the education as well as research training of my female students as well as my male students, ethnic minority students, as well as first generation college students in biomedical engineering. And in the future, perhaps it will be more common to have diverse researchers solving the world's problems tied to health, in particular aging. Diverse groups bring diverse perspectives and also diverse solutions. Thank you. That was pretty nice, right? Yeah, bravo. Our next Tech Talk speaker is Dr. John Harkless, Associate Professor of Chemistry at Howard University. What is quantum computing? What happens when we connect the concept and theory of quantum mechanics to current applications in chemistry? In his presentation, Dr. Harkless helps connect the dots to enlighten us on the promising development of the theory behind quantum computing that has opened doors to new ways of knowing and understanding the intersections of chemistry, mathematics, and physics, the source code of the organization of matter itself. This new paradigm holds the promise of solving intractable problems and opening new avenues of inquiry and development. And if you don't understand what I just said, <laughs> you need to pay special attention as we welcome to the stage Dr. John Harkless. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, outstanding introduction. I would bribe you to follow me around and give it, but I'm paid professor money, so I'll just take what we have here. And thank you and thank Bea for providing an audience that, unlike many undergraduate audiences, are not going to run in terror from a title that includes quantum and chemistry uh, at the same time. 
Um, what I want to do to make sure that we make the most of the limited time we have is to start off by going to this first bubble and telling you the story. So bottom line up front, chemists took quantum mechanics from physics and used that to bring ourselves to a much higher level in our science. What's next is chemists teaming with physicists and other experts across STEM disciplines to bring computing to a new level. So in order to connect these dots, our next bubble is about chemistry itself to give some context to the central science. So defined, chemistry is the science of the organization, characterization, and manipulation of matter. We turn stuff into other stuff. We can tell you what that stuff is and what it used to be. And we can tell you how all of those things are actually put together. Now, in the olden days, before we had access to all the tools and insights from quantum mechanics, we had people like Percy Julian. Percy Julian was faculty at Howard University, later moved on to Glidden, and eventually established Julian Laboratories. He was the first to successfully synthesize physostigmy. Now, it doesn't matter exactly what the compound is. What's important is that his genius level insight, his intuition, is what allowed him to synthesize this molecule and establish the basis for synthetic hormone chemistry. So the entire industry that exists to this day, we owe to his insight. He didn't have quantum chemistry. He just had his own imagination and his own understanding of that science of transformation. Now, in the modern days, we can aid our chemical intuition through using quantum mechanics and computational chemistry. This allows us to better understand and articulate the rules of organization. Uh, we can understand structure and function. And we can use that to predict the behavior when it's time to do those manipulations, when we're turning stuff into other stuff. And so by having that tool in our toolkit, we're able to do more chemistry, to do better chemistry. So let's suppose there's a candidate molecule out there that's going to, uh -oh, that's going to do wonderful things for us in terms of some problem, like solving sickle cell. In the absence of this aid to chemical intuition, we would have to churn through thousands and thousands of candidate molecules. Because we have the ability to use quantum mechanics to improve our ability to understand what it is we're looking at, then we can narrow that down to, say, five promising things. Synthesizing five things is a lot easier than 1,000. Running tests and trials on five things is a lot easier than running on 1,000. And we won't have any collateral human damage, which is very important and one of those ideas that, uh, honestly, Percy Julian helped usher into how we do chemistry to this day. So the next world I want to go to is quantum mechanics. And that's because this is the science that enabled us to improve our chemical intuition. Quantum mechanics is interesting. It's different from the classical mechanics that everyday physics we know. If I were to take a ball and lift it and let it go, it's going to drop, hit the floor, and stop. If I took that same ball, and through it, when it hits the wall, it's going to stop. Quantum mechanics are the rules for very tiny things, like molecules. And as a result of them being really tiny, some things get weird. So it's not exactly the case that I drop the molecule and it just hits the floor, or I throw it and it hits the wall. And when we come back to talking about quantum computing in particular, we'll take advantage of some of those weird things that happen when we do quantum mechanics. The next piece we have to get to before we get to quantum computing is chemistry with computing. I had my training in graduate school as a theoretical chemist. Uh, that means that I'm one of those people who performs this chemistry without the benefit of chemicals. It's a field that didn't exist uh, back in the olden days, but we've been able to grow into something that really works well for us. And classical computing is what we use. It uses ones and zeros, a very black and white perspective uh, from the computing world. Computational chemistry took advantage of the fact that we got increasingly faster computers and we got increasingly parallel computational schemes to be able to capture machines 10 computers at a time, hundreds, thousands, and throw them at some of our most complicated chemical problems. By understanding the quantum mechanics behind that, 
we were able to develop new paths to that manipulation part, and we were able to expand our ability to do characterization. We were able to prove certain things about what we thought were limits of what we could detect, about what we could determine about our molecules. And because we had that refined sense of how to do manipulation and how to do characterization, we were able to do a much better job of articulating how organization works. And so those three pieces of chemistry all got enhanced by our ability to do chemistry without chemicals. So the last bit of technology that we need in order to really step it up another notch is moving beyond that black and white ones and zeros of classical computing. Every possible outcome in quantum mechanics has a probability. Those probabilities have amplitudes associated with them. And this is the part where we talk about that weirdness from quantum mechanics. Um, until we try to see what happens, until we peek behind that curtain to see what's going on, everything could happen. So all those probabilities, all those amplitudes, all those possibilities are just sitting there waiting for us to investigate them and see how it works. And the idea behind quantum computing is that we use those probabilities and amplitudes to investigate that everything that could happen. And once we make an intelligent choice on how we're going to look behind the curtain to see what actually happens, then we get that single final result from our quantum computer. Now, the premise of this, how we expect to team up with experts, whoops, uh, how we expect to team up with experts outside of the chemical sciences? Well, we're expert at designing molecules. Molecules are really tiny. They're quantum mechanical objects. And so we can use those molecules, intelligently designed, to serve as the thing that acts as a quantum bit or a qubit. Remember, classical computing has its ones and zeros, very black and white. Those are the only values it can have. But because the molecule would be that quantum mechanical object, that has those probabilities that allows for everything to happen until we look to see what actually happens, then we're able to effectively teach a computer all of those shades of gray, to have that diversity of views about the world around us that you can't always capture with a strict one or a zero. So chemists make the molecules. Physicists, the people who actually wrote and determined all of those rules for quantum mechanics, they're the ones who can set up the quantum bits, those qubits, to mimic whatever system those classical ones and zeros can't. And that becomes the starting point of quantum computing. So that's the premise. The promise, one of the main things you've probably heard about is the idea that we can break and make encryption. So currently, if we have classical computing, it's possible to create encryption that can't be broken by other classical computers. A quantum computer would be able to break that. Similarly, if we have quantum computers developing encryption, then we can have an unbreakable encryption based on quantum computing. So that's the promise, but we have to build a better toolkit in order to reach that promise. And we have here two people who are working exactly to do that. Alana Spuruguzic is currently faculty at the University of Toronto. Uh, we were lab mates in graduate school. Uh, we stayed in communication, and he's, the, he's started Zapata Computing, which focuses on delivering algorithms and solutions around quantum computing, and he's a science advisor for Kibotics. Uh, he's currently at University of Toronto because he left his tenured full professor position at Harvard University because of the current situation at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, Closer to home, Thomas Searles is a physicist in the uh, physics department at Howard University, and he and I are part of a team that's working to bring back the Roaring Twenties in grand new fashion with the Harlem Quantum Renaissance. But it's this sort of cross-cutting approach, this idea that we need these diverse teams, diverse disciplines, diverse ways of thinking about it in order to truly build that better toolkit and make these things happen. So to close, let's talk about what this means for all of us. Quantum mechanics made us think, see, and create in new ways. As we join across disciplines, as we develop this better toolkit as a result of teaming up a lot of different people with a lot of different perspectives, 
then we will be able to invent, visualize, and solve in ways that we haven't seen before. And that's the promise of what we do. For more information, if you've got um, a QR-enabled screen, you can click the code. If you prefer typing, uh, please feel free to visit my website. Once again, I want to thank you for your time and attention. Um, hopefully, you'll thank me for reducing the level of confusion around quantum mechanics. And I especially have to thank Bea for the opportunity to stand here and talk before this wonderful audience. Very nice job. I understood every word he said. And speaking of technology, be sure to download your Bea Conference app so you stay updated in real time on everything that's taking place during these three days together. To download the Bea app, search Career Communications Group in your Google Play Store or App Store. We don't want you to miss a single moment of Bea's stimulating experience. See what I did there? <laughs> also, remember to tune into Bea TV on channel 59 in your Marriott hotel room and channel 77 in your Omni hotel room for the best in inspiring programming from the nation's top companies and top organizations. And because we know you're never too young to learn about STEM, CCG launched its Becoming an Engineer, a practical and creative guide to planning a career in engineering. This career guide introduces young readers to the exciting world of engineering. Contact CCG to see how they can customize the publication so it looks like you created it for your school, community, or other target audience, and deliver your cost-effective messaging in this high-impact magazine that is a keeper. Dr. Victor McCrary. Now let us turn our attention to the 2020 HBCU STEM Innovator Awards that celebrate the research and innovative spirit taking place at our nation's historically black colleges and universities. These awards are the result of nominations of leading innovative research from HBCUs across the country. We take every opportunity here at Bayer to drive and celebrate the innovation process by connecting and recognizing those who practice it and are at its forefront. Now let's meet our first 2020 HBCU STEM innovator. Dr. Zheng Tao Deng, Interim Dean and Professor in the College of Engineering, Technology, and Physical Sciences at Alabama A&M University. The goal of Dr. Dem's AMU NASA bearing test rig project is to design and build a low rotational speed and low axial load bearing test rig that simulates the relationship between bearing defect frequencies and contact angle variations for high speed turbo pump environments. This is a partnership research among Alabama A&M University Research Innovation in Science and Engineering, Jacobs PKG, ASRI, and the NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. NASA Marshall Space Flight Center delivered a new methodology that enables the bearing defect fre frequencies to be calculated with the actual inner and outer race contact angles that the bearing sees under real world rocket engine loading. The bearing test rig was successfully designed, fabricated, and assembled. The test readiness review was completed in 2018 and the axial, radial, and torsional modal tests on the test rig were performed. Please welcome to the stage HBCU STEM innovator, Dr. Zen Dao Deng. Thank you. I'm so honored to accept this award. However, I want to say that it is really for my team, not for myself. 
Our innovation is a result of collaboration. I've been blessed by my colleagues, my professors, my students, and my university, also my friends. Research is such a challenging and exciting field. It requires a lifelong learning, passion, and hard work. So I encourage everybody here, never stop learning, never give up, and always keep innovating. Thank you. Our next HBCU STEM innovator, feels like a homecoming, is Dr. Kofi Niarko, Associate Professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Morgan State University. He is a listed inventor on seven Morgan State University intellectual property disclosures, three U.S. patent applications, two U.S. patents, and several copyrighted software programs. An example of Dr. Nyarko's innovations is his patented invention, building occupant tracking with visible light communication, sequential relay messaging, and light modules. And I remember about that because I remember reviewing it. <laughs> this was selected as one of Morgan State's 2019 innovations of the year. Dr. Nyarko also provides valuable experiential learning opportunities for his students on real world technical problems. In addition to his responsibilities as associate professor, he is director of the Engineering Visualization Research Laboratory and has conducted research for Morgan State University for 15 years. Under his direction, the Engineering Visualization Research Laboratory has acquired and conducted research funded from major government sources and centers of excellence. Please welcome to the stage HBCU STEM innovator, Dr. Kofi Niarka. Thank you. Some of my fondest childhood memories are those I spent with my older brother as we salvaged parts around the house to slap together <laughs> airplanes that would barely fly, uh, boats that would often sink, um, and robots that would invariably catch fire. <laughs> <laughs> Even though those days were filled with lots of disappointments, um, the feeling we would get when something actually worked was simply amazing. Looking back, it's very clear to me now that really what makes a good engineer is not about really having all the answers all the time, but it's about keeping that flame of curiosity and wonderment always burning bright. Thank you. Our next 2020 HBCU STEM innovator is Dr. Vijay Rangari, Professor of Material Science and Engineering at Tuskegee University. Nanoparticles are, are widely used in biomedical and polymer composites because of their unique tunable properties and applications in automotive, electronic, textile, energy, food, aerospace, and biomedical fields. The development of applications of nanoparticles derived from natural sources such as plant or animal are gaining more attention due to the high costs and environmental hazards of the petroleum and mineral derived products. These include nanomaterials obtained from renewable waste resources, including waste eggshell, seed shells, used coffee grinds, packaging waste, and rice husk. Here to tell us more about this project that helps reduce environmental waste and produces value added products and applications is Dr. Vijay Rangara. Hi, good evening. I'm so honored to be here tonight and grateful to be one of the honors of the recipient of this award. Actually, I grew up in India. Hyderabad, and now I made Tuskegee as my home from last 20 years. I would like to thank uh, one of my advisors and also supporters, Dr. Sheikh Jilani, 
whom I have derived the strength and every day to improve myself to better. And everyone needs such a mentor like Dr. Sheikh Jilani, and I'm lucky to have one in my life. And finally, I would like to thank my wife and my son and my daughter. Thank you. And thanks for the Bay of Thank you very much. Congratulations. Okay. Our final 2020 HBCU STEM innovator, and this is a real pleasure for me, is Dr. Paywan Tiagi, Associate Professor of Mechanical Engineering at the University of the District of Columbia. Go Firebirds! <laughs> he has been a leading research innovator in the fields of nanoscale devices, renewable energy, additive manufacturing, and effective teaching. Dr. Chiagi has bought over $10 million in grants to the University of the District of Columbia as a principal investigator and contributed another $10 million in grants and contracts as a co-principal investigator. Among them, he and his faculty team were awarded a $4.8 million National Science Foundation Crest Center for Nanotechnology Research and Education to enhance UDC's capacity as a PhD granting institution while performing cutting edge research in nanotechnology enabled computer devices, additive manufacturing, and energy science. He is credited with innovative molecular spintronic devices for the futuristic application in quantum computers, unprecedented memory devices, and novel forms of metamaterials. And last year, Dr. Tiagi successfully formed a consortium led by UDC and includes Howard University, go Bison, and Morgan State University, go Bears, <laughs> and DOE, uh, National Nuclear Security Administration, manufacturing plants and laboratories to win a nationwide competitive proposal. Please welcome to the stage Dr. Paywan Tiagi. <laughs> So thank you very much for the award, and uh, I'm really honored to be here. Uh, so uh, this journey has been quite eventful, so I would directly say that my literate parents, actually, they contributed a lot in that, and their lifelong goal was really to provide me two things. Number one was freedom and protection, and second thing was uh, they wanted to get married, uh, get me married to get a family of knowledge creator and knowledge seeker. So my parents really found uh, my wife, the lady in red. <laughs> Stand up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, she has been really behind my most of the steps. So when I write grant, actually she reviews it. So yeah, actually she has been a kind of really the un uh, non-acknowledged really partner in most of the things which I have been doing. So yeah, uh, so she actually she was the one actually who asked me to apply for the UDC when I was visiting a job fair. And I was really kind of just passing by and saying like, just go ahead and do it. And actually that happened. Uh, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, so before joining UDC, I did not realize actually how rewarding an academic uh, career can be. So UDC has really given me wings uh, to my wildest imagination of doing innovation in technology, manufacturing, energy, <laughs> teaching pedagogy, and human psychology. So that's what I'm doing now, actually. <laughs> so my most important, uh, uh, most importantly, by providing uh, numerous challenges and opportunity. UDC has really contributed a lot. So thank you for that. So, and it has helped me come up like a mature child. <laughs> so, uh, so I just uh, finally conclude this uh, by dedicating this award to my uh, family, uh, my parents, my wife, and UDC. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.
Our next Tech Talk speaker is Dr. Jamise Sims, Senior Physical Scientist at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Artificial intelligence is not new to NOAA. Its robust experience with AI applications across a range of mission areas are already demonstrating significant improvements in performance and skill at greatly reduced costs and compute time in arenas as diverse as deep sea exploration, habitat characterization, and processing of Earth observations. By strengthening coordination, operational capabilities, workforce proficiency, and multi-sector partnerships, NOAA's national and global leadership in AI will support science, public safety, and security. Here to tell us more about how NOAA's artificial intelligence is improving weather forecasting and quality control of weather observations, automating weather warning generation, and analyzing satellite imagery for severe weather detection and prediction, oil spill and hazardous material trajectory, wildfire detection and movement ecosystem health, and detection of illegal fishing activity, is Dr. Jamise Sims. Good evening, everyone. Thank you to Bea for inviting me to speak this evening, and also congratulations to all of the awardees. I am a proud graduate of two historically black colleges and universities, Jackson State University and Howard University. <laughs> Tonight, I will speak to you about NOAA's use of artificial intelligence. But before I get into it, let's be honest. How many of us get just a little bit nervous when we think about artificial intelligence? Especially if we say it's going to assist us in weather forecasting. Well, I hope tonight that my talk will calm your fears and actually get you excited about what we can do with the use of artificial intelligence. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration is responsible for providing forecast, guidance, and monitoring on conditions from the ocean to the sun. And we do this by the use of satellite data, numerical weather prediction and supercomputers, radar, buoys, and unmanned systems, just to name a few of the technologies that we use. In 2019 alone, there were $14 billion weather and climate disasters. And it is our responsibility to prepare a weather-ready nation in order to support disaster preparedness, response, and restoration. Would you believe that NOAA has been using AI methods for over 25 years? I can attest to part of that time because back in 2003, my first summer internship was to use a genetic algorithm to parameterize a Gulf Stream Finder model. Honestly, all I wanted to do was study hurricanes. So when my mentor told me that I was going to use an algorithm that would actually identify parents and produce children in order to determine the best parameter to locate the Gulf Stream, I was completely confused. And I definitely didn't know that I was using artificial intelligence back then. But it was honestly the best project that I could have had. Over the years, we have discovered that artificial intelligence methods provide us with a transformative advancement in the quality and timeliness of NOAA science, products, and services. We are currently able to partner with our big data initiatives in order to monitor our data, do quality control with our data, which will support our operational use to make sure that we are providing the most accurate forecast for our public. What you see in this image when it actually did the loop. This is an image of the geostationary operational environmental satellite. This is the satellite that is currently operational in what we refer to at NOAA as the Goes West position. 
The data shown here in this image is from two instruments. It's a geocolor imagery, as well as imagery from the lightning mapper, which shows the blue flashing that um, occurred during the animation. And it's showing a thunderstorm over the Hawaiian Islands. When the GOES-R series satellites were launched, we increased the amount of data that NOAA was receiving by 60 times just by the launch of these satellites. And that's where AI can assist us in actually quality control of data, but also making sure that we have the best data possible. Additional usage of artificial intelligence is shown on what we refer to as the wet side of NOAA. One of the things that is not pictured here is the advancement um, in post-processing of things like fishery surveys, where millions of images are taken during those surveys, we have actually been able to reduce the post-processing time by 98% simply by using artificial intelligence algorithms. In the center of uh, this slide, you can see that the radiative transfer model is actually reducing the compute time from one and a half hours down to one second by the use of artificial intelligence. Our National Ocean Service and National Weather Service researchers are partnering together in order to determine how we can use artificial intelligence to detect rip currents from coastal imagery. This is extremely important because rip currents often cause many deaths from surfers. These geostationary operational environmental satellites, as I mentioned earlier, is a game changer for weather forecast. We use satellite imagery in order to monitor our environmental conditions. We also use it to initialize our forecast models. That means that we take the data that we receive from the satellite and actually input that into our forecast models for numerical weather predictions. And that's actually how you get your forecast from the broadcasters and things like that on the news. Unfortunately, when there's a failure, we always learn the most. And we had a failure with our GO-17 satellite. The main instrument, the Advanced Baseline Imager, has experienced a loop heat pipe anomaly. What that means is that the instrument does not cool properly at nighttime. This is very unfortunate because when things like tornadoes happen, they have the most impact if they happen at night, meaning that usually there are more fatalities when tornadoes happen at night. Our geostationary satellites were expected to be able to provide us with a lead up of data. We were expecting to have much better forecasts at night, in which we still do, but we are experiencing degraded imagery. So from that, as I mentioned, first you can see on the left side, you can see that the imagery is a little bit degraded. But then on the right side, we absolutely cannot use that imagery. So there were several mitigation teams put together to find out what can we do. How can we use what it is that we know, the technology that we do have, in order to overcome this anomaly? One of the mitigation proposals at this time is, of course, to use artificial intelligence. What you see here is an image of how we can use the same algorithm that detects facial imagery from our cell phones in order to overcome the missing images that we have from the satellite. This is not operational just yet, but it is a direction that is possible for us to go in. This would assist us, again, with having the needed data in order to provide even more accurate forecasts. Another example of how NOAA uses artificial intelligence is through neural networks with a base uh, ensemble model. Ensemble models actually use data from several different um, model, forecasting models in order to produce the guidance that we need. So what we're seeing here is a composite of, of data that used an artificial intelligence algorithm 
in order to reduce the sharpness as well as minimize the false alarms that we see in some of our output. It's extremely important that we warn the public so that you take action or know when not to take action. And this is why it's important for us to make sure that we are giving you the right information. I hope that in these few examples that I've shown you with the time that I have, that you now understand that we have transformational improvement in performance, skill, compute time, and cost with the use of artificial intelligence. As we continue to advance, NOAA has developed a strategy with five goals in that strategy. What we look to do is to provide better organization and coordination, provide better research opportunities, and also take research into applications. And we're doing that by partnering with cooperative institutes, as well as our cooperative science centers, which include HBCUs and minority serving institutions. We're also looking to promote, promote a workforce that is very well trained in artificial intelligence. Again, this is something that we're not only looking to do with our current workforce, but also our future workforce. In conclusion, together with artificial intelligence, our strategies for unmanned systems, omics, cloud, and big data, we are looking to significantly improve performance in our life-saving and economically impactful missions in order to accelerate our renowned environmental science and technology leadership through the 21st century. Now, how many of you believe that artificial intelligence can be a great support to operational weather forecasts. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
People commute in their cars and they spend a lot of time in their cars. While they're spending time in their cars, how do we help make that a productive zone? What are the things you do? Maybe buy gas, have a toll, buy coffee, but you don't want to worry about all that payment and stuff, and I really want you to keep your hands on the wheel. So how do we make that happen? Because if you don't do it in the right way, technology, for technology's sake, does not work. So how do we do it with the right consumer experience? So let's take a look at what we suggest could happen in the car. What's the quickest way to Yurko's house? 10 minutes via the freeway. Perfect. Low fuel. Would you like to get gas? Let's make it quick. $37 to fill up. Fill up. Okay, rerouting now. Fill up at pump six. I need coffee. Take it to the nearest coffee shop. There's a coffee shop nearby. Order four large coffees. Okay, your total is $12. Pay now. <laughs> hey. Ooh, where are we gonna park? Find available parking. There's a garage nearby. Spot 268 is available. Redeem points for VIP passes. So. You like that? I'm glad. I'm glad because we've been working hard on it for a while. The, um, what we want to do there is no one's interested in the payment. No one is worrying about Visa. They just want to go to the concert. But we want to take care of their tolls. We want to find them their parking spot. We want to get them to the head of the line. How can we help do that? And that's what IoT and innovation in this particular instance allows us to do. There's other technologies that get involved, which we'll talk about. So that is the car, but we have smart scooters, we have smart kiosks, we have smart TVs, and everyone today says, I have my phone, I can do everything on my phone. I suggest to you in the future, you might not have your phone, you might use other things. There might be different ways that you operate. Yeah, you might still use your phone for something, but you might use the device of which you are proximate to. If you're in the fridge and you open up the fridge and you're like, oh, God, I want to make pancakes tomorrow and I don't have milk or something that I need. You close the door, you hit milk, it orders it and has it delivered to you for Sunday and you can make eggs. Now, you're not going to go run and get your phone for that. You don't need to. You were in the fridge, it hits you at that moment, and that's what you want to do. And so we want to think of these things going forward. So in the next thing where we're trying to push the ecosystem further, Grandpa is going to move in with mom, dad, and son. And they're interested in helping grandpa move in and make his room perfect. Brennan's home. Did you find a lamp for your dad's room? I think so. What do you think? I think it's a lamp. <laughs> yeah. Great. Let's go pick it up. Call us a car. Locating available car. You use our Visa card to pay now. Come on, Brennan. 
I'm looking for a TV I can mount on the wall. Sure. Here's what we have in stock. This one looks good. I'll add it to your cart. Which payment plan would you like? Let's do 12 month installments. Tap here to check out. Try it now. It works. Oh, look, that's here. Tip the driver 15%. Let's go. Welcome home. So what do you think? This is great. I love it. Great. Hi, Grandpa. Hi, Brendan. <laughs> like my room? Yeah. So what are we feeling like for dinner? <gasps> I think Grandpa wants pizza. Uh-huh. Pull up recent orders. Better make it an extra large. Place order. Yes. All right. So the idea there is in multi-mobility, you might be in a scooter in the city, you might not own a car anymore. You call it when you need it. You talk to your smart speaker when you, want to, when you want to order it. So there's different ways people are going to live in the future, and how do we change things to evolve and, and, and meet their needs as, as the society is changing? So what you'll see, though, is IoT also brings in other types of technology to make that superior consumer experience. So when Alex got in the car and it, um, Iris scanned her eyes, it authenticates me. So that payment's not going to happen unless I have Alex's eyes or whomever Alex has authorized can use that payment. Then it observes me and detects patterns, machine learning or deep learning. It detects fraud and recommends for me. So I notice you are never on Pennsylvania Avenue at 8.30 in the morning. So should this payment really be yours before I approve it? And so you can use AI for good. Where did where, where, where'd my lady go? The AI is for good. And so digitally pays for me, e-wallets in the car. So I'm not fumbling for stuff. I have something, a token that represents, represents my credit card that sends that to the seller to pay. And then safe and convenient, hands on the wheel, voice in the car, voice commands. And then compensates me. I didn't have to figure out that I was close to a place where I could get rewards that would compensate me with VIP passes. I don't have to search for them. It rewards me at the right time. That's what makes for the experience. That is also what you have to consider when you're doing innovation, when you're considering IoT. The other thing is we have a responsibility. When we understand and have this data, it should be done in a manner that is trusted and respects my privacy. That should go in in the beginning of the experience while you're developing, while you're innovating. So the other thing that comes up, because I love IoT, I love innovation, I've got a great team, I love my job. The thing that we need to do is, while it's fun, we want to make this something that people can use in their everyday lives. Technology for technology's sake is not the way to go necessarily. So how do we do it fast? How do we do it across markets globally? How do we bring it to market? That means we might have to work with partners that also have the same values and guiding principles that we do and respects data privacy. And no consumer is going to adopt this if it doesn't work for them. So if we take in all those factors as we go through innovation. As Visa has been working on security, we worked on developing digital wallets. We worked on very, um, um, developing wearables, Fitbits that you can pay, pay with. We moved to card on file, and now we're moving up the scale to bring in IoT, future use cases, so that we can bring those visions to life that I just showed you. How do we do that and reset the marketplace? Because a lot of times people feel we're so comfortable with what we have today, 
innovation is the thing that allows us to look to the future. And if I like, make a plug, it's that foundation that you get from studying science, technology, engineering, and math that allows you to do this in the car industry and then move over to Visa and do it in commerce, all right? So anyone going into STEM fields, please continue. It is the foundation and thing that will build you up and carry you through the rest of your life. Just, I had to say that, sorry. Okay. So as we talked about, biometrics, it's me. Deep learning, we can make sure that it's still you because you don't usually do that. Tokenization, I can protect your credit card information. Voice, I can keep you safe, hands on the wheel. Cybersecurity, so we make sure we're looking at everything to make sure that your um, data isn't hacked and, and broken into. Things I'd like to remind you, the way we pay today is not the way we will pay in the future. That's why we do science, technology, engineering, and math. Today, we use terminals and cards. Tomorrow, we'll probably pay with IoT and biometrics. Every day, we'll want to be able to pay any seller anywhere. So, if I'm in Nigeria, I want to still find my favorite chicken and waffles place. And do it with wearables, biometrics, or devices that are within our proximity. Security measures are paramount or no one's going to want to do this. Tokenization, deep learning, and cybersecurity, IoT can make that easy button to connect these devices to all of these sellers. And innovation, that investment today is what makes us ready for tomorrow. Because that cute little girl, she's going to be like, a credit card? Mommy, what's that? All right, so I appreciate your time. Thank you. Congratulations to all the award winners. Interesting. Looks like there's more shopping in my future. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, yes. <laughs> Well, this is a great opportunity to share knowledge and celebrate innovation. We thank you all for coming. We congratulate our award recipients and invite all of you to continue creating and innovating. Have a nice evening. This has been so wonderful, right? It has, it has. And we hope to see you again next year. We're gonna see you around this weekend, right? right. Did you enjoy this? All right. Round of applause. Thank you so much. Okay. Will the award winners please stay around because we're going to take some photos. That's it. We're going to take photos right here. Yeah, we're going to take.